And with that, I am very excited to introduce our speaker for today, the other Sam in this chat, Sam yeah. James. Um, Sam is a mechanical engineering technician at, in the Aerospace Composite Models Development Section at the NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. So just a little bit north of us in Raleigh. Um, he builds model aircraft and spacecraft for NASA researchers to be tested in wind tunnels. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Sam, and I will hand it over to you. Okay, let me share my screen. <laughs> All right, thank you. Again, my name is Sam James Gang, Panic Engineer and Technician at NASA Langley Research Center in the Aerospace Composite Model Development Section, and I'm in the Fabrication Technology Development Branch. So basically, we build research model aircraft and spacecraft for our NASA researchers. And our main objective is to make these uh, aircraft and spacecraft faster, more fuel efficient, and safer. So I'm from Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Uh, that's in the northeastern of North Carolina, about, um, about 30 minutes from the uh, Virginia line. Uh, I graduated from Northeastern High School in 1983, uh, Elizabeth City State University in 1987 with a BS degree in industrial technology with a minor in electronics. So uh, this, this is an area view in the bottom left-hand corner of um, Elizabeth City. It's right on the Pascatank River. And I'm about an hour and 15, hour 20 minutes from uh, Hampton, Virginia, is where NASA Langley Research Center is located. And I'm about uh, 49 miles, which is about an hour from uh, Elizabeth City, is about an hour from Kitty Hall where the uh, Wright brothers first took their flight with the Wright Flyer. And they have some of the biggest sand dunes uh, on the East Coast, which is some of you guys probably visit there, but it's pretty awesome. I frequent there uh, myself, been in them so close, but it's pretty awesome at Jockey's Ridge, Kitty Hawk. So these are some of the personality traits which are good to have as an engineer or engineer technician. Self-motivation, uh, being a good listener, being creative. You want to adapt to change because technology is con uh, constantly changing. Uh, use your time productively, uh, critical thinking, team working, welcome new challenges, problem solving, and patience. Critical thinking and problem solving creates inventors. That's how a lot of inventors uh, create things by using the critical thinking and problem solving. Now, I uh, have a lot of hobbies and interests. I got into, and as I got older, my hobbies and interests changed a little bit, but uh, it's pretty cool to, to do some modeling and acting and, and cooking. And I learned how to play the trombone in the seventh grade, uh, a little arts and crafts. But I didn't, I was in drama in high school, but I didn't, really didn't see acting in my future until someone had approached me about modeling. So I did uh, runway modeling for department stores. And also I did, I did runway first and then I started doing a lot of print work. But I had an opportunity to get into acting and I was doing reenactments for the new detectives and the FBI files, which are shown on Discovery Channel. And also the Interpol Investigates and um, National Geographic. So this is my journey. This is how I got started. You know, I started, you know, started in elementary, middle school when I start brainstorming about what will I be doing, what I want to do. Uh, very, I was very inquisitive about things. I love to see how things work, uh, like automobiles, um, radios. I mean, things like that. And then I would take them apart and then put them back together. But I started out getting into airplanes, but making small um, paper airplanes and just folding and see what different types of airplanes I can make just using paper. Because just like uh, NASA engineers, they design that aircraft or spacecraft according to the capabilities of how you want that uh, vehicle to fly. So if you want a faster airplane, it has to be left, less wing area and more of a pointed nose. So uh, an airplane with more you know, uh, lift, you need more wing area and not necessarily fast, but you're looking for something that will glide. So I got into balsa, making balsa airplanes, even boats, and then some parachutes, kites, and then I love building tree houses. So new technology fascinated me. Um, 
I got into fixing up bicycles in the neighborhood. So I had friends in the neighborhood that would come over and I would help them fix their bicycles. Um, so one day this happened in my home, uh, my home room uh, in middle school. My teacher asked us, you know, what we would like to pursue, what could your career choice we would like to pursue. And I had no idea, but I knew what I really loved. I knew what I liked, which was math and science, but also I loved uh, using my hands and building things. So I used my guidance counselor. So she suggested that, hey, I, you know, choose a career in technology. And so that's what I did. So I ended up choosing industrial technology. So she, she uh, devised a high school curriculum for me where I took all my higher math and sciences. So at Northeastern High, um, this is some of the, the key STEM courses that I had taken. Actually taken, I had general biology first and I was doing well in general biology. So I had my teacher to transfer me to advanced biology. And then I took my algebra and my geometry, my trigonometry, my calculus, technical drawings one and two, that's drafting. So you guys are using computer aided design now. So back then we, we used the pencil. We had the architect scale and um, mechanical drawing pencil. And then we had a T-square to do our technical drawings then. And also physics and chemistry. And my school activities, I, um, I was in football, played linebacker. Uh, now soccer is center fullback and I played baseball, right field. Now I was also in the drama club and the art club, art society, and I built floats uh, for parades in our local uh, community. And these pictures here, this is my senior picture here, a soccer picture up top. And down the bottom was uh, a tour that, it was a field trip that my art teacher took our art class on. And I think what we, once we got there, we did kind of like a landscape of the Pascatank River and surrounding areas. So it was pretty, pretty neat. So this is my college days. So I entered college in 1983, graduated in 87. So when I got there, what I noticed, um, a lot of my uh, classmates didn't take the path that I took as far as taking my higher math and sciences. So, and also technical drawing in one. So what I found out, engineer graphics one and two, uh, most of uh, most of the class didn't have this in, in high school. And and um, so once the, the the professor found out that I had engineering graphics one and two, so he had me to assist him in helping the, uh, my classmates uh, in drafting. And also took industrial plant management, uh, psychology, fluids technology, and statics and strength of materials. Statics basically is uh, involving like uh, trust, like um, in, in other words, how much a bridge, how much weight can a, a, a platform hold or a structure hold. And strength of materials, you're, different, you're dealing with different types of materials like graphite and fiberglass and composites. And then manufacturing processes, a computer program, and I have computer program in one and two also. And in my college activities and what I established here, and I established studies groups when I was in our high school, and this is very helpful. So you find out which classmates have the same major as you have, and you get together, form a study group, and you go, we go to the libraries when we get ready right before, a few days before we have our tests or final exams, and we study together, which is very helpful. And I played intramural sports, and I played uh, football, and I was in drama also in college, and I was voted Mr. Sophomore my sophomore year. So coming out of um, college, actually before I gradu graduated, a few months before I graduated, my electronics professor said, hey, Sam, NASA Langley is hiring uh, technicians. You might want to put in an application. So I thought about it. I said, yes, you know, why not? But I thought about all the competition that they were having because I know a lot of, you know, students would, you know, try to get into NASA and I didn't know if I had a chance or not, but if I didn't try, I, I would never know. So I went to the uh, Office of Personnel Management in uh, North Virginia, downtown Norfolk, and um, got on file with the federal government. You had to get on file if you wanted uh, to work with the federal government. So about a year, uh, for, about a, a month before I graduated, or a month after I graduated from Elizabeth City State, NASA Langley called me and asked me what I want to position in the aerospace composite and model development section in me. And I was really excited. I, I'm, really, I'm pretty much nearly flew through the roof because it's awesome. I mean, I didn't see NASA on my radar, radar, but what happened with me, I was taking all my STEM courses 
And but I had that foundation of STEM. If I hadn't taken the STEM courses, then I would have never had an opportunity to work at NASA Langley. And it just worked out that way. <clears throat> so I never thought I would be working at NASA Langley, but I was prepared as far as you know having the right courses and the STEM courses. So going in at NASA Langley when I was hired there, I had to work on the senior technicians to learn how to build these dynamically scaled uh, model aircraft and airplanes. <clears throat> These pictures are fine, but it's amazing to see them in person. They're very, very unique airplanes. So these, these airplanes, model airplanes, have to fly like the real airplane. So when you're scaling a full-size airplane down to a smaller size, everything has to be proportional. And so also when we are measuring these models and when we're building these models, uh, we measure out the three decimal places. Like, for instance, 1.023. We have to measure out all the way out to those three decimal places. That's, that's how accurately they are built. So according to the size of the model aircraft or spacecraft, um, the tolerances are very tight. The smaller the aircraft, the smaller your tolerances. The bigger the, bigger the model aircraft or air, uh, spacecraft, the bigger your tolerances. So a smaller aircraft, let's say on a smaller scale of like one or 2%, you know, you're talking about, you can't be off no more than 15 thousandths of an inch when you're measuring. And, uh, and just to let you know too, I had a <clears throat> I had an industrial technology, a BS degree in industri industrial technology, but this um, position as a, a mechanical engineer technician is a mechanical technology background. So when I got there, I had to take a few more classes uh, on center at NASA Langley to make it a mechanical technology uh, background. So I had to take advanced composites one and two. I had to take numerical control programming one and two. Numerical control, numerical control, I'm not sure if you guys uh, know what that is, it's, it's NC programming. So basically you're using uh, numbers or measurements uh, to program. So that's why they call it numerical control. And it's a computerized machine that actually cut out uh, patterns and, and molds. And I had to take fundamentals of flight, uh, metallurgy and compound English. I have, I actually have some pictures of a, uh, the numerical control uh, cutting up uh, some uh, projects. So down below, um, this is a model 1% blended wing body. So once I graduated from the apprentice program, which was in 1991, so I got there in 1987, and I was in the apprentice program for four years, graduated in 1991. That's a picture of me receiving my uh, certificate in the right-hand corner. So the models below is a 2% is a blended wing body. This is the first project I led uh, when I got out of the apprentice program. So I had four other technicians working under me. And so the wind tunnel that you see, the, the white uh, blended wing body, and it's a 20 foot vertical wind tunnel. So basically you have the blade, the blade is up, actually up at the top of the tunnel. And it's actually pulling air from the bottom up. So we also test our spin models in here and also rotary models. So what they look, in that wind, look for in that wind tunnel is, uh, uh, flight characteristics of how that, uh, or tumbling characteristics of how the airplane is flown. Okay, this is this is just some of the materials that we use. If you see in the top right hand, uh, left hand corner, we have honeycomb, and we also have what we call a test specimen. So we have, uh, if you see my cursor here, we actually have fiberglass on the top and fiberglass on the bottom, but we put it on a vacuum something like you see here, but it's on a flat surface. And then what we do, we test that specimen and see how, mu how much weight it could hold, you know, before it actually breaks. And here we have a mold and this material, I'm trying to find my cursor here. This material is actually, oh, there's my cursor. This material here is actually 40 pound foam. It's a high density foam. It's a cavity for a 1% blended wing body. And we and that's the most crucial part of our uh, making these models, model airplanes and, and um, model spacecraft, is that we need these molds to make the outer surface, which either could be fiberglass or graphite, or sometimes it could be both. And we have a um, project here. This is the back side of a, uh, a layup for a lunar rover. And you see a technician here laying out the fiberglass first. So several layers of fiberglass we had to put down first. And then we use this epoxy resin. And you see my cursor here in the middle. We use epoxy res resin with the catalyst. And then we'll saturate it with what we call a squeegee or a paintbrush. 
And then we'll put it on a vacuum like you see uh, right here, this model here. This is high density foam. So we have different types of density of foam. We have uh, four pound foam, what we call four pound foam, uh, 10 pound, uh, 20 pound, 40 pound foam, different. So the higher the, higher the density, the heavier the foam is. The lower the density, the lighter the uh, foam is. So down in the right hand corner here, this is a, a, a top view of how that honeycomb looks. And as you can see, we get the idea, they get the idea for, uh, from a bee's nest. And they found out this structure is very helpful. It's a man-made structure made by a company called Hexel. So we use that as a core in making our uh, final products, but it cuts back on the weight a lot uh, because of the structure, the structure of it. So it's hard, it's hard to compress. But, but trust me, anything can be broken and these things has, have to be tested. So we have a, a, what we call a structure slab and all they do is break uh, test specimens of composites that we produce for them like graphite, Kevlar and fiberglass. And they'll see how much, uh, how much um, weight it takes to break a particular test specimen. So we have graphite here on the left-hand side on this first row here and in this Kevlar here. And this here is called prepreg. On this uh, carbon fiber on a roll here is, is a prepreg. We call it prepreg because it has resin in it already. So what we we <clears throat> this is a lot cleaner. We don't have to add resin, and it has resin in it already. And but the thing about this prepreg material, it has to go in the autoclave. So we have I have an autoclave in one of our uh, labs, and it's huge. It's like a big oven. But it has to get baked at several different temperatures, anywhere from 100 degrees up to like 500 degrees. It depends on what the researcher wants. Okay, the change in technology since I've been working there. When I start working there, first started working there, we had to use the mold and pattern making process. So basically, you're making a mold by hand. And one one um, con about this is that it takes so long to process. It's unique and, and pretty cool to use, but it takes a long time to produce the mold. So we had to make a pattern first. We had to get uh, generated uh, sections from the um, researcher. And then we have to produce um, templates. And those templates come at different shapes. So we had to compile all these templates together you know, and do a, and cut it out with a wood. And basically we use pine wood because pine is easily to call car. So in the middle here, we see a finished product, product of a F-18. And this is the mold here that we made that uh, pattern, made that mold from. The pattern is right here. So pretty, pretty much once we finish that pattern, we'll cut that, cut that up and send and put it in the trash basically. And this is a pattern of the wing for F-18 right here. So basically, so basically what we use, once we produce the pattern, we lay up what we call a, a gel coat around it. And we let that gel coat get real tacky for about an hour, let it sit. Then we, we lay up thick layers of fiberglass around it, about uh, 30 thousandths of an inch thick. And then we uh, build the, uh, the mold around it. And then we, what we'll do what we call egg creating shape. You can't see the bottom, but, but we'll, We'll build a structure around the mold so that will support it and keep it from warping. Okay, the second row is computerized numerical controls, computerized machines. I was telling you about will be used to cut out either patterns or molds for our product. And this is high density foam that, that is used. It has a it has a, a X Y Z axis. So you're talking about vertical, uh, horizontal, and also diagonal axis. And we have also what we call a five axis also. So going into 3D printing now, now uh, we're, we're producing uh, 3D printing parts. What's so cool about this is like it's overnight, you know, we could we could program something on a, on a Friday and come in on Monday and it's completed and it's finished. And so what we have here is a, uh, on this table here is the newest, latest design of the blended wing body, which I have more pictures in my slides. And this is actually the full size, Airplane is about uh, the width of a football field, about 300 feet wide. Oops, sorry, I went. I think I went backwards. <laughs> okay, no, 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 no. Let me go back. Went too far. Okay, I'll get there soon. And in the middle here, we also build helicopters. So basically, our machine shop 
produce the uh, metal structure and we had to produce the uh, the ABS part, uh, 3D printed parts to attach to the metal structure of the helicopter. It's, it's a Kiowa helicopter, K-I-O-W-A, and they wanted uh, more weapons on this helicopter uh, for the Army. Here we have a uh, 757 3D printed additive manufacturing, uh, and we had to build that in parts. We couldn't, we couldn't produce, produce that whole um, model airplane in the chamber, so we had to make it in parts so we can attach everything. Once it's completed, we attach all the parts together with fab fasteners. And Sam, we have a question for some yes. of these models here. Um, yes. Carol was wondering how often do you have to fix mistakes in the model? For instance, like with the computerized ones and 3D printing and things like that. And you say how, how many mistakes? How often do you have to fix mistakes? Oh, oh luckily not too often. Um, That's good. You know, I would say, you know, they may make maybe one mistake, uh, maybe two at the max, but they pretty much, pretty much read on it. They did a pretty good job in producing them. But that's I mean, good. we do make mistakes though. I mean, that's true, but it's not a lot. It's not too many. Yeah, yeah. And um, we Ellie- have a good track record. That's good. Definitely, definitely a positive. Um, Eliana was wondering, is the part where you build around the model called making a positive? If so, do, do you do that to make, or do you make a model by inject injection molding? Uh, that process, we do, we do have an injection molding process. Uh, it's for um, what they call lost wax. They inject wax and, um, and then they dip it in ceramic material and then they melt out the wax so they can pour a metal model. So that's a very good question. And going back to the positive and the negative, the, the mold is a negative. So, and the pattern is a positive. Okay. Yeah, so very, I love the questions. Very good, good to know. Questions. Thank you, thank you. All yeah. right, that's and all I, we have I, for right now. You can stop me if you want to, you can stop me. Yeah. And ask a question, that's great. Thank you. Because you might get tired of me talking. <laughs> no, 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 I just wanted to ask those because they were based on the, the slide that you're on right now. I, there are a okay. couple more, but I'm gonna save those for it. Okay, a little great, bit. great. And, all right, and go this, ahead. This here is the blended wing body and, and that's the Langley. Uh, this started back in 1990. And uh, they, they partnered with Boeing, the airplane industry. They actually make the full-size airplanes. And some other partners investigating this, this uh, design. They, that's why they call it the blended wing body, because the whole model itself was like a wing. And um, so the, the future for it is for air transport for commercial and military applications. Now, the military will use it like for a cargo plane. And so commercially, you know, basically, they went to use it you know, to take people, uh, a, a certain, uh, I think a, a large certain amount of people, I think it then were from 650, I want to say 650 to 800 passengers. So the reason why they was come up, coming up with this, because at the time, a lot of people, more people were flying at the time and they wanted to be able to accommodate them. But um, so that that had changed because, and we, was, we were doing this uh, for Boeing uh, in 2011, when the 9-11 attack hit. Uh, so Boeing kind of backed off of it a little bit because we were going to build the 14.7% blended wing body, which is like anywhere from 35 to 40 feet wide wingspan. It was going to be the biggest model we ever built in our building, but, but it never happened. Um, but they still researching it now with smaller models. Uh, again, these was early on, these models were early on. And so we, we have we have different scales. We have five different scales of this blended wing body. The first one, the blue model up in the right-hand corner is a spin model and it's remote control and, it, and it's flown in a vertical spin tunnel like you see in the second picture below it. And basically they open, they have a door where they'll toss it in there like a Frisbee and then they start flying it. And then they have, when they finish flying it, they'll drop it to a net, a net at uh, the bottom. And then they have this robotic arm where they go and grab it pulls it out and then redo it and retest it. So they'll test it uh, uh, long enough where they're happy with the data that they're get, getting from it. Now we have, NASA Langley have 23 different wind tunnels at NASA Langley alone. And some of them as small as 12 inches and the biggest we have is like 40 feet by 60 feet. Now the reason why they, we build different scale models is because they've flown in different wind tunnels because each wind tunnel has a different capabilities 
and then some have different speeds also. So we built a 1% scale, a 2% scale, 3%, 4%, and 5% scale of the different uh, blended wing products. Okay, oops, I think this is right. Yeah, yeah, I think this is what I want. Yeah, 757, this is one of my favorites. Um, built this in 2001, built three different models of this. And it's a five and a half percent remote control. General, they call it the general transport model. It's actually a, a, a Boeing product, but with respect to Boeing, NASA elected to call it a general transport model. Although Boeing didn't mind if they call it the 757 Boeing. But it's, uh, it has small jet engines, turbine engines, and it produced 20 pounds of thrust in each engine. The engines you see are down at the bottom here, where you see my cursor, these are two engines right here. And so we, we get it from a, a company called JetCat out in California. Each engine is like $3,500 a piece. And um, so we don't take it for granted that these uh, models, uh, I mean, that these engines produce that uh, 20 pounds of thrust. We had to check, check it first. So they would check it once we received them, they would check it and make sure that these, each engine will produce 20 pounds of thrust. So let's say for instance, you know, you don't check it and you assume that both engines produce 20 pounds of thrust, one engine can produce 20 pounds of thrust and the other one can produce 15 pounds of thrust. And then you have a problem. So that, the airplane is not gonna fly right. So, so we definitely check them first. So in the first picture here, we have the, the, the large 757, which we used to store it near our NASA Langley back in the late eighties and early nineties. And that's the full scale on the background. And then in the foreground, you have the five and a half percent um, uh, GTM model. Now, now, guys, if you want to see this on YouTube, we have several clips of this flying, of, of uh, test pilots flying this. So if you if you Google, you go on AirStar, see my cursor here, AirStar program, or the GTM five and a half percent GTM model and just type in NASA Langley, you'll see of all these videos, of videos of all these models flying, testing them, and which is pretty neat. So up in the right hand corner, uh, this is the fuselage. So to give you an idea of how we make these, we have a mold here. So we have two molds. So what we did with this, this actually has a honeycomb core. If you remember my previous slides of all the materials, and you remember how the honeycomb I was telling you about, and basically we, we make like test specimens. So we have a honeycomb core in this fuselage here. So what we did, we laid fiberglass first, you know, saturated with resin and put it on the vacuum one day. And then the next day uh, we came back and bonded the uh, honeycomb inside using the vacuum method. And then the third day when we lay down another layer of fiberglass. So basically got a sandwich, but it helped us cut back on the weight because that's one of our most challenging things of building these dynamic scale um, model aircraft and airplanes. It's a challenge to keep the weight low. So we try to keep it light as possible. So that's why we try to come up with different type of materials and techniques we could use to keep the weight down. Okay, let me go to the next one. This is, this is a nice one here, um, inflatable airlock. I actually spent two years working on this and, and every single day I was really engaged from day one. Uh, they started out with different materials, but the problem that the researcher had was um, he couldn't keep a seal on this, on this vinyl material, which is a bladder that they have that goes inside of this uh, the soft goods. This is actually called soft goods, it's an inflatable airlock. And, uh, and they use this for uh, to cut back on weight uh, for the space vehicle when they take uh, items up to the space station, and they want they want to have it light as possible. They want everything and everything is meticulous when they packing to go in the space vehicle. So they want to get rid of the hard shell and come up with a soft shell, uh, which they call it inflatable inflatable airlock. So instead of using a hard shell, which has a lot of weight, they can use a soft shell like this called soft goods. And, and the early concept here was needed because uh, I basically made three subscales first before I made the, the full scale. The full scale is like 10 feet by 17 feet. And so they was used as demonstrators to convey the idea uh, to upper management and even to uh, uh, people in Congress because they also, you know, come up with uh, uh, demonstrators to show Congress, you know, how this would work so they can get money for it. You know, so um, 
they were critical, you know, toward the definition of the approach for fabricating full scale demonstrators. And so the multiple uses, they were using as crew cabins. Uh, it could be used as a space hanger, inflatable freezer, a quick response hospital, and living quarters. And they will pump it up once they get it there. They would uh, inflate the inflatable once they get it up there in space. Uh, and they, they're using this idea uh, for going back to the moon and going back and going to Mars. Um, and you can see down the right-hand corner what how they how it would be used in the animation down in the right-hand corner. And I have one here too, another animation. Let me see if I can find my cursor. It's like here it will be attached to the lunar rover, and then um, then they can connect it to the habitat where the astronauts will live. So instead of the astronaut put putting his suit on to go outside to go to his habitat area, you know it would be like a hallway where he can just walk through an inflatable hallway which is pretty neat. So it'll make life a lot easier for here. Let's see. Okay, and this is this is one thing we need more than anything too, the wind tunnels. So basically the wind tunnels simulate the full size airplane, airplane or space um, craft in motion. So they have to use um, a wind tunnel uh, with, uh, which large uh, blades about 16 feet well, this particular one, the transonic tunnels, I think they have uh, the blades of like six, 16 feet on some of the tunnels here. But um, you have a subsonic tunnel, which is speeds is below the speed of sound. The transonic is the speed of sound. And you have a supersonic, which is about five times the speed of sound. And then you have, uh, we have spin models also. But so basically, again, you simulate uh, the environment of a full-size airplane that's in motion. And we also, back in the late 80s and early 90s, we also had the NASCAR guys coming in and using our wind tunnels. So basically, uh, you, you check for, they check for aerodynamics, aerodynamics on an on a, a automobile just like they do an airplane. So, and their main objective, again, is make them faster and lighter and more fuel, fuel efficient. So when you make them lighter, that means the material is going to change. So back, you know, 30, 40 years ago, they used to make all these cars out of metal. So now they're making them more like fiberglass and plastics, you know, so the, but the frame itself is, is still uh, made out of metal, but then the outer surface of it is more like fiberglass and plas hard plastics to cut back on the weight to, for a better fuel economy. So the orange, orange tunnel here is pretty neat. That's, that's a hypersonic tunnel. That's 4,000 miles fast. That's uh, anywhere from, I think they get up to like 10 to 11, no, 10 to 14,000 miles per hour of speed that they're testing. So they are testing what they call a national aerospace plane that's supposed to fly at those speeds. I think up to like 17,000 miles per hour, but that's like way in the future. I mean, it could go above, it'll go up in the upper atmosphere where you don't have any air at all, which you wouldn't need in the air because it's moving so fast. So therefore it will have not much wing area, but it have very thin, you have a very thin surface and very thin wing area because of the speeds. Okay. And it's also awesome working with NASA interns. We have uh, high school and college interns. And these groups here, the big groups, they're actually, they actually came in under a, a aerospace, aerospace academy um, that was coordinated by, I think, NASA headquarters in DC. And these kids come from different, uh, they have different, career, different uh, concentrations as far as their careers, and they're from different universities all over the nation, Texas A&M, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech. So, and then they had to come together uh, and with this project. And the, the, the black and yellow model that you see there is a UAV that's supposed to uh, enclose a package, just like Amazon and Google wants to do. So they have to, they have, so they're given, <clears throat> they're given the, uh, the instructions on what, what they're supposed to do. And then they have to build this, they have to struct, uh, construct this. And then that's when I was asked to, you know, to help them you know, find the materials, help them do the vacuum layup. So I assist them, you know, much as I can uh, for them to make the structure here. So, but 
but they did the majority of the work. Um, you have a software engineer, you have a mechanical engineer, you have aerospace engineers. So all of them had to come together collectively to make this happen. And each one of them had to give a five minute presentation on their part, what they had to do uh, to complete this model, or to make this model a success. Uh, the group here um, in the left hand corner, the um, two guys with the red shirts, they had to make a flexible, they call it a morphing, a, select, a flexible wing where it could adjust to the outside environment. It's called morphing. So that means change. So they were looking at, just like a bird, for instance, if you see a bird flying and as, as the wind changes, he will stop flapping his wing to save his energy and just adjust to the outside environment. So basically he's conserving his energy instead of you know, continue to flap. He said, well, I'll just use this wind to guide me. And so they had to come up with that. Um, the group down there with the, uh, the orange model is called the Tigress. You can see the black stripes on it. They call this the Tigress. So this, this model, had, it's a UAV, so it had to fly. They would fly this like, let's say it's on crop like corn or something like that for a farmer. And they had to fi find the dry areas in the crop that's not, that hasn't been irrigated. So in other words, you know, why, why irrigate all the crop when just certain areas are dry? So if you find those certain areas that are dry, you could irrigate those spots instead of have to irrigate all the crop. So um, that was pretty neat. And this guy in the left-hand corner, his, um, his name is Noel, who's a high school intern for like six months. He's actually doing a layup on the 1% blended when he body uh, using graphite. So once he finished too, he had to give a, a presentation also of why uh, NASA sh uh, chose this particular design and how it was tested. And the guy on the right was Lane uh, Thomas uh, out of West Virginia. I think he went to University of West Virginia. He, he is holding a 50% scale Mars flyer. So they were using the Mars flyer to scan the, the surface of, uh, it was a proposal by NASA Langley that Mars flyer was used to scan the surface of Mars to see if they could find water. I know my 30 minutes is up, but in closing, the first steps towards success is realizing who you truly are and not who you want to be. And I look forward to the questions. I probably went over 30 minutes. <laughs> Oh, no worries. No, I mean, everything was so interesting. There were some really great questions and a okay. lot of people are, are sharing their stories um, with Langley. Um, Tina was saying that uh, their father worked at, um, worked on the Boeing 737 and oh, wow. in the wind tunnels and things like that. In, in yeah, Langley, 737, so. I remember that. Yeah, the 737. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, Ken and Eileen also said that uh, they worked as a NASA intern um, back when the, when the wind tunnels weren't nearly as large as you said that they are right now. So a lot of, a lot of people have, have this near and dear to their hearts, which is awesome to see. Um, Carol one, was- One thing I want, one oh, thing I yeah. want to say too, I didn't mention, I meant to mention earlier, but we also built, uh, we also built a, a model aerostyle van for the Ford Motor Company. That's back awesome. Back in 1998. So that's to give you an idea of not only do we build this model aircraft spacecraft, we can build models of other things also. Exactly, yeah, not just limited to, to aircraft and things. Right. Um, Carol is wondering, what is the most surprising result you have ever gotten in a test? A test. Okay, um, actually, I don't do the test, but I can say one of the most, uh, I would say the 757, the, the um, GTM model, the one that had the small jet turbine engines, because I had to go out in the field. So when I was working with that group, when they broke it, I fixed it. <laughs> so when they break things, I was there on there and to make sure, make sure that um, I had to gas up the, uh, the, the turbine engine uh, model, the, the 757. So we had enough fuel for like 11 minute flight. So every, when, they, when they get to like, when they get to like two minutes and then they start counting down, they will land it. So I take care of that and I make sure the batteries are charged in the airplane. But it's a fascinating airplane to just to see. It could they could fly it up to 200 miles per hour. The little, they, the little model? Yeah, that uh the 757. Yeah. You know, uh it's about it's about seven feet, close to eight feet long. Okay. The one that I had um next to the uh, full scale 757. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, you get up to 200 miles per hour. Wow, that's but incredible. Check those videos out. You wouldn't believe it on YouTube. Yeah. A lot of it on YouTube, you can see it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we pasted okay. one of the one of the videos, but I'll have to see some more because yeah, that was yeah, really amazing. fascinating to me to see that. You know, I'm like wow, just in like, action. Yeah. But but for that airplane, it's called refuse to refuse to crash. So they built it for the the, uh, the aerostat program. So what they want to do is be able to take the controls from a pilot if he have a if he make an error, if the pilots make an error, or if you have a component error on the airplane that someone remotely could take the controls from the airplane and land it without the pilot even doing anything. So yeah. it's pretty pretty cool research that they're doing. Yeah, I mean, definitely. that's one of the amazing things, you know, you, you know, although you work there, you're in your little compartment, but then you see what's going on around you. It's amazing to see other things that are going on around you. Yeah, definitely, agreed. Um, okay, Dan was wondering, uh, going back to the inflatable space habitat that you were talking about, um, how safe would the soft product areas be from micrometeorite impacts? Micrometeorite, and that's, I mean, yeah, that's what they would try to avoid, um, you know, stuff like that. But the material is tough, though. It's made out of material called Vectran, and it's supposed to be just as tough as Kevlar. Okay. So that that's a good question because this this is the reasons why they're using this type of material. Because you go up there, it could be you know it could be submitted to different things like what you mentioned. You know, up in space. Yeah. So it has yeah. to be tough. It has to be a material that's not easily unraveled or damaged. Mm -hmm. So that is a good question. Definitely, yeah. Um, and Tina was wondering. Okay, so so you mentioned that it was named like the Aerostar product, and where did, where did Aerostar come from? Um, actually, just the research the researchers named Air uh, Aerostar. Okay. Uh, they just came up with that name. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> uh, but like I that. think now yeah, I think it's a, I think the star is an acronym for something, but I I can't remember it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they use a lot of acronyms. Though. I, yeah, I was gonna say that's that's one thing that I've noticed this week is that there are there are a lot of acronyms, but I mean. Yeah. Makes sense. Easy way to remember things. Yes, least. and we did. We do get people. We had Jackie Chan. I'm quite sure y'all heard of Jackie Chan, but he he had come to our uh, section for a tour, but he was at NASA Langley doing a. a um, he was doing something for the PBS station, public broadcasting station, uh, in our wind tunnels, and so his his group, uh, whoever was in charge of that, was you know thought that he would love to see you know, our uh, section, the models and all, which he did. He really liked it, but it was cool to have him in our, in our building. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, MJ is wondering, are you planning on working on any SSTO or space planes? SSTO, most likely probably. And, and see, that's the thing. So those NASA researchers, they come up with all of these new and innovative ideas. So whatever they bring to us, then they'll come to us and say, well, because they have, they have some companies on the outside can do do this some of this stuff, but they rather have an in house right mm -hmm. you know built right there where they are, and so they'll come to us and say hey you know they'll they'll tell us about the project show us the plans and then ask us could we do it, and so basically we build any new innovative ideas that they have we pretty much try to bring it to life. Yeah, which is awesome. I mean, like your team yeah. is the one that like brings it from paper yeah. into like you know yes yeah. this is a possibility. Because we have made fake asteroids too. Oh, really? Yeah, we have made fake asteroids. So oh, that's fun. They needed an asteroid. <laughs> are they, are so, like, are those, would those be used in like the wind tunnels or? They used that to simulate, um, and they didn't, they presented this to Congress and it fell through. Congress didn't buy into it, but it was for, um, they wanted to, they wanted to capture an asteroid. And examine it. Take some, take some of the material out of it, and examine it, and just <laughs> see the composition of it, what it's made of, and all. And uh, so basically, we made the asteroid. But what they did, they put twenty thousand pounds in the middle of that asteroid that we made, so it can simulate the asteroid as much as possible. Yeah. And so they presented it. They presented it because we had some uh, people from Congress come to the center to see the demonstration and, and then at the end, the end, the Congress didn't buy into it because they were trying to get Monday funding for it, mm -hmm. but Congress didn't buy into it. So they had to scratch, scratch that product. Yes. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, the bane of the existence is trying to find the funds, I right? <laughs> I know. Yeah. 
All right, that is really cool though. I hope that in the future we will be able to do projects yeah, like that true. where we can like- Exactly, because just because, just because they scratch a project now doesn't mean it doesn't come back. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Right. Yeah, we've definitely been, been, yes. That is something that would be really cool to see in the future. Yeah. All right. Okay, so unfortunately we are out of time. I am going yeah. to share my final slide. Um, well, but I did want to say thank you so much, for, Sam, for coming yeah. in today um, and talking with us. It was fascinating okay. to learn about all the cool models and fabrications that you've made. Sure. Sam, um, I thought I think I gave you my Twitter handle. If they want to yes. come to my Twitter handle, they can, I, they can see stuff too that I post. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Sam has a lot of really awesome pictures of the projects that he's working on and things like that on his Twitter. I think Nancy put it in chat, but we can post it again if um, if it was missed. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much for everybody who came and tuned in today. Um, thank you to our sponsor, the North Carolina Space Grant, and our members of the museum, which help, who help make events like Astronomy Days happen. Yeah. Um, if you want to join our membership, the link is down at the bottom of the slide here. It's naturalsciences.org slash membership. And if you join, you'll save 10% on the t-shirt and the hoodie that you see here, and you'll get exclusive access to members only events and discounts and other discounts and more. Um, there are other great programs scheduled for the last day of Astronomy Days today. Um, we do have a couple more talks going on. Um, so we posted the link in the chat for uh, how to register for those. And we'd love to hear your feedback on our programming. Um, so we'll put the link of the survey that we have in, in chat as well. And we will email it to you if you've registered for the program. Um, but we'd love to hear your feedback. So. Uh, please fill that out for us. And uh, finally, uh, the recording of this program is going to be posted on the Astronomy Days program page, as well as our YouTube playlist that I believe Nancy posted in chat. So um, if you wanted to come back and see any of the, the cool projects that Sam was talking about, again, then feel free to check out the recording of that. Um, and thank you again so much for attending. And thank you, Sam, for speaking with us. And very we hope welcome. you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.